Autobiography, Fletcher Jones told of how he put people before profits and prospered. Inspired by a famous Japanese visionary, he shared the ownership and management of his famous clothing company with his staff. Born a pauper, traumatized by war and limited by a severe stutter, Fletcher Jones changed his world with a dream of equality and integrity. country town of Warrnambool, Fletcher Jones opened his first tailor's shop. No one at the time would have imagined that he could turn his small business into a clothing manufacturing empire and a household name. He overbought. Um, he wasn't turning over his stock at the rate that was needed. And uh, he sort of didn't have enough cash flow to pay his bills. So his creditors, they entered into a scheme of arrangement with him. He wasn't allowed to clear his own till. He had to give up the keys of his shop to the landlord who would let him in in the morning and had to sell everything that was of any value. And uh, it, it sort of must have been very, very tough times. Jones needed great tenacity to move from these unpromising beginnings to his later successes. And as it happened, his childhood had provided exactly the challenges that built this resolve. He had a very bad stammer. His stammer would cause the other children to laugh at him and make a fool of him. Due to his speech, his father got him this job as a tomato grower. He was on his own and so forth, not talking to people. His father was a union blacksmith who was laid off for long periods without welfare. Jones saw the suffering created by harsh working conditions and how his family drew strength from their Christian beliefs. Jones would overcome the disadvantages of his childhood, but he would not forget these experiences. They inspired him to create a more equal society. We had no hospital or me medical benefit. We had no insurance. C concept of sick pay did not exist. He saw that workers within the gold fields were basically being exploited. Many a house would have a sheet hung up on the veranda and behind the sheet you would hear a man coughing his life away. And Dad told a story about it in one case of a family taking the coffin with the body in it and leaning it up against the front door of one of the mine owners. And so Dad had this feeling that there was a great amount of injustice out there in the way in which workers were treated. And I've no doubt a feeling that the world could be a better place than this if ever he was given a chance. Destined for a life of manual labour, Fletcher was curiously drawn to the local tailor shop and the dignified work of a master craftsman. Get your fresh rabbits, ladies. With the outbreak of war in 1914, Fletcher Jones did his duty. The dream of becoming a tailor was replaced by a nightmare. Fletcher Jones was buried alive by a huge explosion. He lay under the mud for four hours before his mates were able to dig him out. He remained unconscious for eight days. He's, he certainly had shell shock. 
and eventually he was repatriated back to Australia as a TPI veteran, totally and permanently incapacitated. Um, he, he used to tell the story that he, he, he queued up for the pension once and then when he was in the queue then it's the, uh, the second time he shouted out, I'm buggered, and ran and he never went back for the pension because he knew he had to do something else. Classified as an invalid, army doctors advised the shell-shocked, stuttering man to become a salesman. Learn to talk or starve, they said. Where others may have been defeated, Fletcher Jones bought a hawker's wagon and optimistically set out to change his fortune. At first he tried with cheap things and he thought, you know, for instance, the farmer's wives, they might like to buy cheaper aprons. But then he found that they, they wanted good quality black aprons that would last. Despite his stutter, the charming Fletcher Jones discovered he was a good salesman and soon he was employing others to help him. Jones came to realise that compromising on quality was false economy. From this time on, this was to be a guiding principle for him. Now, much more than just a hawker, Jones proposed to his childhood friend, Rena. Rena and Fletcher were friends at school. They went to the same church. They went to the same youth groups. My father really needed my mother. He needed to share everything with her all his dreams and also his insecurities, the visions he had, and she just encouraged him. After two more years on the road, Fletcher and Rena settled in Warrnambool. But Fletcher Jones had miscalculated. With five tailors in town and his shop at the wrong end of the street, the young couple found themselves out of their depth. For years we battled on, unsung and unloved, trying all things new, persevering with new ideas, till the day dawned when frustration ground us almost to a halt. Fletcher Jones learned from his early troubles. Debt makes a slave of a man and he can no longer think creatively, he said. This time it was Fletcher Jones' openness to new ideas and people that delivered a major breakthrough and it came in a surprising form. You do what I tell you to do and you will be wealthy man. Charlie was a swagman and an itinerant tailor with a talent for lateral thinking. Maybe. He told Fletcher Jones he should make ready to wear trousers but good quality ones. Charlie's formula was simple. My total output was eight suits a day. Eight suits is our quota. Once the staff had made their quota, well then they should go ahead and make trousers. Charlie's advice was in tune with the public's growing readiness to buy off-the-rack clothing. Well, we tried it. And it worked. We passed the savings across to our customers in the form of lower prices and trade boom. We'll see you on Friday. Fletcher Jones' revived fortunes allowed him to move into bigger shops. He finally paid off his debts in full, emerging from his own financial crisis as all around him he began to witness the misery of the Great Depression. The, the distribution of the world's wealth was and still is the world's most pressing problem. Well, I, I wanted to know why the rich were, were getting richer and, and, and the poor were getting poorer. And that, and that was the catalyst really that, that got him thinking and wondering what can I do? What can I do for the world? Making up for his poor education, Fletcher Jones now read aloud every day with his wife in the hope it might cure his stutter. Jones read the how-to manuals of business and with Rena's support also tackled deeper economic and social theory. 
I tried to read the world's great economists and social reformers. Much of their phraseology was beyond my comprehension. And then I studied the concept of cooperatives. I was fascinated by the, the pioneer cooperative movement in England. But finally, it was the writings of Kagawa that were most satisfying to me. Toyohiko Kagawa was known as the Gandhi of Japan for his selfless commitment to creating a fairer society. He developed an alternative model for organizing society based on shared ownership and community participation. After the Great Depression, thousands throughout the world saw his cooperative movement as a way to create a humane economy. Kagawa worked in the slums of Japan, set up children's homes, worked out very innovative schemes to provide affordable housing for poor people. In the mid-1930s, Toyohiko Kagawa toured the USA speaking to enthusiastic audiences in 120 cities. Word of Kagawa's philosophy spread across the Christian world and he was soon translated into all the main European languages. In 1935, Melbourne's Presbyterian General Assembly invited Kagawa to come to Australia and he drew big crowds. They, they said, oh no, he couldn't come to Warrnambool. So my father wrote, wrote them a letter nearly every day, just pleading with, with them to come. Kagawa staff were so absolutely amazed at his enthusiasm that, of course, they decided to come to Warrnambool. We had sessions at 3.30 p.m., 7.30 p.m., 9 p.m. And the town hall was packed each time. The committee had arranged for him to, ha to have a suite in Melbourne. And there I had several memorable sessions alone with Kagawa. At this time, Jones was worried by the gap between his growing fortune and the fortunes of others. And he broached the question, how can I serve God with all the money I've got? Do I have to give it all away like you did, Kagawa? And Kagawa's answer was very interesting. He told my father that he should have died in World War I and God had a plan for him. And the uh, gist of it all was there's nothing wrong in having, having money as long as you use it as God wants you to use it. Fletcher Jones embraced Kagawa's ideas he was so enthused, he wanted to see how the cooperatives worked in practice. And so about a year later, my mother wasn't surprised that he wanted to go to Japan to study Kagawa's uh, production and consumer cooperatives. A five-month tour of Japan opened Fletcher Jones' eyes. He found the cooperative model inspiring. It was more than just a consumer co-op. It included health, housing, education and financial security for all. Fletcher Jones returned to Australia determined to create a business based on a cooperative structure. But once again, war would postpone his plans. As a garment manufacturer, Fletcher Jones was ordered to support the Second World War effort. Members of the Department of Supply came to Warrnambool, as he put it, in, in, in a big government car to see him, basically to instruct him that he had to make army trousers. Under wartime regulations, Jones was ordered to accept the instructions of the government. But he said he couldn't possibly make cheap trousers. Using his considerable powers of persuasion, he convinced them that he should make high-quality trousers for farmers instead. 
The new trousers proved so popular that Fletcher Jones put on more staff and distributed the trousers to retailers across Australia. He introduced fractional fittings and added new colours and stylish designs. By war's end, this ready-to-wear high-quality trouser came in an astonishing 72 scientific sizes. Fletcher Jones proudly announced, no man is hard to fit. The plus eights had arrived. Dad would see a pair of trousers as he said, a pair of murdered plus eights coming towards him. So he'd go up to the person, introduce himself and say, well, look, I made those trousers. If you don't mind, I'd like to get them back to make them fit. And then if the man would post them back to him, Dad would have them altered and post them back to the man. And by the way, who sold them to you? And so Dad would get the name of the retailer. And if it happened often enough, Dad would strike the retailer off the list because he wasn't playing the game, the game of 72 scientific sizes. And, of course, out of that, after a short period, Dad started to run out of retailers, and that's why he decided to open a shop in Melbourne. The new shop in Melbourne was an instant success. Staff had to limit sales to one pair of plus eights per customer. Eager ex-servicemen queued for hours to purchase a pair. We didn't have any capacity to make more trousers, and so he had to open a factory. So he bought some land, dirt cheap, at the other end of Warrnambool. Three quarries were part of the land. The quarries had been used as rubbish tips, so it wasn't beautiful. The year I started with FJs, I went to the dawn services and Mr Jones spotted me. He said, he'd go, oh, 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 hop in the car. He always ran a Buick a car, I think it was. And he took us out and he said, we're negotiating with this piece of ground to build a factory here because this is it. we've outgrown where we are. And he decided to make it a garden factory and was renamed Pleasant Hill. Finally, Fletcher Jones was realising his dream. He was building not only a factory, but also a workers' cooperative. Every employee would be a part owner of the company and as a result would benefit directly from its success. The name of this new company was to be Fletcher Jones and Staff. And the original concept was the family would have two-thirds and the staff would have one-third. He went to speak with his legal advisor and said, look, I would like to show the staff that I'm fair dinkum and give them 51% and we'll have 49 And uh, FJ says that his <laughs> legal advisor said, you don't want a business advisor, you want a psychiatrist. <laughs> Dad smiled and, if, and then by the, by the time FJ Organisations was formed, which was the big company, uh, which was two or three years later, well, the staff owned 53%. It grew and grew and eventually the last time I heard the staff owned 71%. The share had a value of a dollar and they allocated you the first 90 and at the same time you were given the opportunity through payroll deduction to buy another 90. So which naturally everyone took up because they would have been extremely foolish at that time not, not to because it was very lucrative. The dividends it was pretty good those days from 16% uh, to 80%. Uh, it was good money. There was a lot of good money. Staff numbers grew and all employees, old and new, enjoyed the rewards of shared ownership, good bonuses, high dividends and job security. Yeah, we all uh, were very keen to show our loyalty, I suppose. That's probably one reason we bought shares as much as anything else, our loyalty in the company. FJ's became a household name and Fletcher Jones and staff continued to expand as stores opened right across Australia. On Saturday morning, you know, they sometimes a hundred people waiting at eight o'clock and the store opened at nine. And at, at nine o'clock there would be two hundred people waiting. 
and uh, but gradually we built more and more stores. As demand grew, production expanded and more and more skilled staff were needed. In an industry competing for migrant workers, Fletcher Jones felt they should be on the docks to personally greet new arrivals. We needed staff and we found that it was most important and easy to get good skilled sewing machinists from Italy. And uh, so we used to uh, sort of take a bus down to the docks because through the networks amongst the existing staff we tended to know who was coming on what boat and so we'd send somebody down there with a bus and people who could speak Italian. The majority were Italians and Greeks but we had uh, Turks, uh, Yugoslavians. Uh, one time we were something like 27 different nationalities. Me, a little tailor from Italy a little town, we had a, a paddle machine. I never saw an electric machine in my life until that day. When I went into the machine room, they gave me a piece of material, a square piece of material. They said to me, uh, do something, guy, whatever you like, uh, a pocket or something like that. As soon as I heard the pocket, I, said, I thought, well, I think I got the job already because to me, you know, it was uh, nothing. I did the pocket, they were happy. Uh, by four o'clock, he came, with, uh, he came and got me with this envelope, he gave me the envelope, he said, that's your pie. I said, my pie, I opened up and I said, there was a lot of money, it was, virtually it was a full day pie. And I said, yeah, come, it's too much money. He said, no, no, guy, no, no. He said, you got up this morning, you came to Warrnambool, you stayed here all day, as far as we're concerned, you worked all day. And that was the kind of people that, that they were. Fletcher Jones helped a lot, a lot of people. He had two things in mind that that man was uh, quality, service to the people, because that's what we're here for, and, uh, and, and to make sure that people did not get ripped off in any way or form. We were working one night, uh, us Italian boys, uh, I was singing, I was singing an opera, like all Italians, they think they're singers, but they're not. So I started to sing, and uh, I came to the great finale, uh, and I went really high. And there was no one else working except the uh, four Italian boys there. And then we had this clapping hands. There was the old man. And we Italian boys, we, uh, excuse the English, we, we shit ourselves. <laughs> We were, we were, I said, my gosh, the boss, we, we can pack up and we got the sack, <laughs> which we never did. He had a few words with us and uh, a big smile on his face and, and we relaxed and after, after we saw the smile on his face, uh, and it uh, was, was nice, it was nice, yeah. My father was um, quite overt and he had a, a bubbling over personality and uh, people were drawn to him. Uh, when you had been with him for five minutes, you felt quite comfortable and very easy because he he just came up that way and made you feel that way. Yeah. You could be very well aware of him as a sort of source of power. A very strong person. Not an overwhelming person, but a strong person. He, he gave himself no great emphasis, just quietly went about achieving the things he wanted to achieve. I remember he used to say to us, what I say whispers, but what I do thunders. Fletcher Jones invited Neil Simons, the same lawyer who told him he needed a psychiatrist, to not only join the company, but to now set up a system called Management by Consultation. Formal directors' meetings were rare, but discussions between people actually involved in areas requiring decisions were frequent. All employees were at once both management and staff. He believed that if somebody had a need to make a decision, the best way to do it was to go down, bring together the people in that section of the factory that are involved, call them together and say, let's stand here and talk about this issue and you give me your ideas. It had the effect out in the factory of feeling that they had a pathway through right to the very top. 
Uh, my father was very stern on any executive who showed any evidence of making decisions without consulting with the workers concerned. So this was all part of a culture which we developed. It was a pretty democratic sort of a setup. It's like a upper house and lower house in Parliament, but a bit more effective than them, perhaps. <laughs> in his usual egalitarian way, Jones refused to acknowledge traditional hierarchies between workers and managers. At Fletcher Jones and staff, he insisted, there was no such barrier. His son David, who joined the company in 1953, shared his father's vision for the cooperative. You know, the, the sort of terminology, worker participation, he would have seen that as being somewhat uh, indicating that there are managers and there are workers, and that we were trying to create a culture whereby they were equal. There were never management dining rooms at Pleasant Hill. These sort of managers shared the same canteen, the same dining room, and stood in the same queue. The town, in lots of ways, adjusted itself to Fletcher Jones. Now, an example would be that you would never go up the main street at 5 p.m. in the evening. Um, you best be home at 5 p.m. because Fletcher Jones got out of work then. And there would be buses and there would be cars everywhere. So people tended to make sure that they'd done their shopping, whatever, for the day. And they're basically off the street for that hour. The company always did things the right way. I mean, the share dividend always came out when the local rates had to be paid. It came out a fortnight before that. You know, they always took into consideration the welfare of the worker. It was a big family, actually. That's what they used to call the Fletcher Jones family. I met my girl at Fletcher Jones, got married, three kids, so on. We built a new house, brand new house before we got married. I said to my parents, well, I can't send any more money because I I got to get married. When they heard that, they came straight away. <laughs> so they came to Australia, and my father worked at Fletcher Jones for eight years until he retired. And, uh, and so my father was happy too. Um, when I started in 69, every year was a record year. I mean, whatever product we made, we sold. We had people uh, waiting to get the product from us. You know, stores would be constantly harassing us for more stock. Uh, we worked as much overtime as we wanted to. For young guys who wanted to do apprenticeships, there was always the opportunity there. In the days when I was there, you couldn't help sort of improving your position by just being in the organisation. It was very well set up. We had five factories in the end, and we made ladies wear. We made men's men's suits. We made men's shorts. We had men's shirts. Now we had men's pullovers, jumpers, all these articles. But every article produced by the organisation had to be perfect. And then while all this was happening, of course, the shops were being expanded. And when we went into the 70s, well, then that's probably where the company um, reached its peak in terms of staff numbers and in terms of um, product sold. We had at one stage 3,000 people working for us and we had 50-plus um, stores, which rose in the 80s to 69 to 70 stores. Um, you know, the company was all about growth and there were no really dark clouds on the horizon. Fletcher and Rena Jones had come a long way from the hawker's van. With belief in themselves and in others, they had created a large and successful business with a peerless reputation for quality. But their life together was drawing to a close. In 1970, Rena died. Fletcher Jones had been withdrawing from the company passing the baton to Neil Simons, his long-standing deputy. In 1974, Fletcher was awarded a knighthood for his services to both business and the community. He died three years later. On the day of his funeral, Production at the factory did not stop. 
Instead, his now more than a thousand Warrnambool employees lined the highway outside his gardens to see him pass. Now, I'd been there 18 months, probably, uh, at FJ's at the time. Uh, I can remember the uh, funeral cortege going past the factory, all the workers going out uh, to uh, pay their respect as it went past, uh, and can recall thinking that it was the longest funeral I'd ever seen. The cortege went on for ages, uh, and it seemed a long time before everybody from the garden sort of broke up and went back inside. From the time that he was a young hawker, Sir Fletcher Jones said, no man is too hard to fit. Today, the people of Warnable remember a man who will be hard to replace. Tom Walland for Seven National News. Not only had the company lost Sir Fletcher Jones, but like the rest of the clothing industry, it was facing serious new challenges. My client list was formidable. It involved banks, breweries, airlines, major retailers. You know, I had a, a lot of very important clients during my years as a business consultant. And there were very few companies for whom I had particular regard. One of them was Fletcher Jones. I remember sitting in the office with the chief executive who was keeping a fatherly eye on David in the absence of his real father. And on the table in front of him was a pair of of trousers, of Fletcher Jones, gentleman's trousers. And I said, well, why are they there? And he said, well, I'm, I personally answer all the letters of complaint, and there's been a letter of complaint about these trousers. I said, what's wrong with them? He said, well, as you can see, and he displayed the gusset to me. They seem to have been eaten away by, um, by the application of urine over a prolonged period. And I said, well, and? He said, well, I'm going to write and uh, tell the gentleman we'll have them fixed for him, repaired for him at no cost. I said, oh. I said, uh, I don't know of another company where the chief executive would personally handle the complaints. How old are the trousers? Are they still under warranty? He said, no, no, no. He said the, the trousers were purchased in the late 1930s. So here's a pair of trousers, 40 years old which Fletcher Jones were going to dutifully and uncomplainingly repair. I didn't know of another company like it anywhere else in the Western world. I remember driving out to Warrnambool and seeing that extraordinary hanging gardens of Babylon surrounding the factory and being told by David that he could be voted out of office at any minute by what was, in fact, a workers' collective. I mean, all of this was, was so... So eccentric. David Jones was finding it very, very difficult to move women's clothing. How odd. Everyone conceded that the quality was of the very highest, so we did some research, and the problem turned out to be the quality. It was too good. Women said, look, we don't want clothes to last forever. We find it very hard to morally justify replacing them, and if the damn things won't wear out... And so his clothing that uh, refuses to give up. And so far from being an advantage, it was, uh, in a marketing sense, a disadvantage. What does a lady wear under her kilt? So I remember the first campaign that we put together, and the whole idea was to de-emphasise quality, not even to mention its moral virtues as clothing. What does a lady wear under her kilt? A Fletcher Jones label. The kilt in pure new wool, only at Fletcher Jones. In one sense, there was this romantic view of what the company should and could be. The idealism was extraordinary, poignant. It made them seem to me quite vulnerable. During the 1970s, we had high inflation on the one hand and very little growth on the other, high unemployment. There was a lot of uh, opinion that thought that it was, we had to wind back the, the protection in Australia if we were going to start making progress again. Fletcher Jones and staff had thrived in the economic environment of protectionism. 
For over 70 years, government policy had protected the local clothing industry by heavily taxing cheaper imports. Well, after the war, of course, we decided that we had to populate or perish. And, of course, if we were going to attract more people, which we could quite easily in an immigration program, then we needed to be able to provide employment uh, for them all. However, all that was about to change. David Jones, who became managing director in 1979, now had to fight for the company's survival as governments continued to reduce economic protection. To address these changes, he partnered with several international clothing companies and took advantage of their new technologies. Hi, I'm Bill Hewitt, the Information Systems Manager at Fletcher Jones. By 1972, we introduced our first computer, a small IBM System 3. In 1975, we did the first step into the factory for automation. The, the growth of the company was such that the staffing that they had couldn't cope with the growth that was there. And so David was of the opinion that efficiencies would help in that process rather than have to continually bring in new people and train them up. So we were in a wonderful situation of, of being able to put in new systems, new technology, new procedures which improved the throughput without having to discard people. We'd been investing in high technology for 15 to 18 years. We were world class in terms of the technology. But in the end this would not prove to be enough. Despite being technology leaders, Fletcher Jones and staff were finding it harder and harder to stay competitive. We were making a pair of trousers in a, uh, around about 110 minutes. That was the plus eight. Now we gradually got that down to around about 32 minutes. But we were still paying a very high cost per minute compared to what you would pay in China. The Chinese could afford to make that same trouser in 50 minutes and still end up with a much cheaper product. Throughout the 80s, you know, the door on imports was widening and opening at a very, very rapid rate. And our competitors started to import. We didn't. And I guess when you look back, one might say that that was a basic mistake. But the real dilemma we faced was that we employed people, shareholders in fact, who worked in our own factories and we were determined to have a go and keep those factories busy. And so Fletcher Jones and staff launched a number of strategies to face these enormous challenges. One of these, based on a Hagar model, was to make huge runs of Reed Street trousers to sell outside their own retail chain. In the late 1980s, we sort of decided to take a very, very successful Hagar marketing concept that they had sold very successfully into Walmart, and we would bring this concept to Australia, and we would sell it to one of our major mass retail chains with Australia-wide coverage. Well, my pet hate was Hagar. Once we introduced Hagar, and I know I go back to Hagar, but... It was an American, they called it a trouser, it was an American garment that David at some stage had been to America and I think it was to do with um, computerised cutting and that type of thing. He'd been to Dallas anyway. Somehow he got into cahoots with this mob called Hager and we made their trouser under licence here in Australia. The Hager was, a, uh, as I said, a cheaper trouser. Uh, the Fletcher Jones customers, they weren't used to that. It had to be simultaneously released in all stores. So we had to build up a stock of over 300,000 pairs of trousers to do that. We met our commitment. We didn't get the feedback. We had to spend an enormous amount of money with our own staff going out and taking stock. It was a disaster. Which was the year that I was pushed out. Well, the roller coaster was great, but then it stopped. I don't know. More than, stopped, more than stopped, it ran off the rails. Now facing receivership, the board asked David to resign. 
he agreed to go. He hoped new minds might find new solutions. This stage, David had gone. This stage, I mean, they pulled the rug out from under David, but it was too late. I mean, it was just too late. The National Bank uh, realised that they had to either put the company in receivership or sell the company, and uh, they wanted to avoid the stigma of putting a national icon into receivership. So they approached Palaco with uh, an offer for Palaco to purchase Fletcher Jones. We had a meeting in, uh, which was in Warrnambool. Uh, the meeting uh, basically by the undertakers, uh, you know, because they, uh, there was no more no more money and the Fletcher Jones basically ceased to exist as we knew it. The employees had had to vote and their choice was to lose their shares. They had to balance that against losing their jobs and the company going into receivership. In the end, the company was sold to a um, clothing manufacturing group uh, and... Uh, the shares were declared worthless and so none of the shareholders got anything and then in turn the company's been sold on again since then. When I retired I still held them of course but when the when the company went bust we all lost our shares. Anyway that's that, that's life. Oh, I know people that have lost about 20, 20, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 thousand. At the same time, as a family, we lost all our shares too. To be exact, I think I had about 27,000 shares. And, uh, well, we lost them. Well, you just had to bear it. There was nothing you could do about it. It wasn't going to change. I mean... It had happened, it had happened. And these were part of the conditions of, um, you know, any takeover. And clearly there was a hope there on people's parts that their jobs could be saved, notwithstanding the fact that the company was now known as Fletcher Jones and not Fletcher Jones and stuff. You know, it goes back to poor management, perhaps in lots of ways with Fletcher Jones. But it's like, I mean, you could take it right up to the federal government, you know, what they did to us. We found ourselves later on in the trap where, because of competition, you become less efficient because the volume isn't going through the factory. And this, it, uh, this really puts an extra price onto your, your product. You know, we had to save more money. And then the best way to save money is to, you know, if you're paying someone 16000 if you put them out the door, you've saved 16000 in the next 12 months. It's as simple as that. The boss rang me and said, I want a list of the people that you want to sack on my desk tomorrow morning uh, when I come to work at 7 o'clock. You've got 28 people. Um, there's a list of names. I want it to be 20. And you give me that back as soon as you can. Well, what's as soon as I can? Well, we'd like to know by tonight. And I said, uh, we are just a week before Christmas. Can we... Have Christmas, and when we come back, we'll do that. He said, no, it's got to be done now, because we can't pay them. And we actually went through and culled them on the spot and um, paid them off that day. You know, and then it really hit home to everyone. Well, you know, the lolly parade's over. It's fair to come stuff now. I was retrenching people on a regular basis. We tapped them on the shoulder and said, sorry, but, you know, you're finishing up now. That was it. In one day, I uh, sacked 84 people. Some of them understood and supported me. Some, they uh, felt bitter. And it was tough, especially with people you work with for many, many years, people you'd sat on school boards with, um, your kids grew up with. Guys you went to the football with, guys you played football with when you were younger, you know, and you had to be the one to tell them, well, I'm sorry. You know, 
longer required. But they were extremely hard times. They impacted, as I said, hugely on my life. Severe depression, alcoholism, marriage breakup, and then the icing on the cap. Of course, was then, well, thanks, Peter, you've done your job, goodbye. It was extremely demoralising. And you're given your best years from the time I was 19 or 20, right, for 27 years. I give my best years and to have, I suppose you could say, a stranger, an outsider, say to me, well, you know, you've done your job. Hop it. Competition isn't only quality, etc. It's also price. So we had to look at the importation of garments and gradually phase out the Australian manufacturing. Because the machinery was very, very old and the cutting tables were wearing out and to replace the machinery would have cost probably half a million dollars. So uh, I, I gathered them together, about 12 cutters, and I said to them that I was terribly sorry, but we had to close the cutting. And um, there was a bit of a silence, and, and then a couple of them said, well, that's all right, Ted, you've given us an extra 12 years of work. We've raised our kids, and uh, it had to happen. But, um, yeah, Fletcher Jones was warnable. It really was. You know, um, and all we have now is, as I say, an old building, you know, built on a rubbish tip. And unless someone buys, it'll probably go back to that. Fletcher Jones purchases a lot of fabric in Australia and sends it overseas to be manufactured. And uh, there's no reason that can't continue because when the garments come back into the country, they have no tariff. There is very little clothing industry left in Australia at this minute. And uh, it will only get less in, in the future because of the cost of labour. People got old, people got other jobs. Uh, they probably moved away from, from Warrnambool and um, me, I'm still here <laughs> and I'll probably finish off the, uh, here because I'll, I love this place too much. Every, every garment that I pick up in my hands these days is made in China, yeah, everything. Uh, I think the government is obviously has got a big problem because we sell a lot of wheat coal, copper, gas. We sell billions of dollars to China, so uh, this little industry, they have to give it away. I've often thought we should have been prepared to keep the market and to sell the factories and to have the factories in China and so the co-op could still exist, but it would have been a retail marketing co-op. You know, I've often thought about that. Uh, was I wrong? I don't think so at the time, because what we tried to do was put up a fight. You know, to keep the manufacturing going and keep the thing going, but uh, it didn't work out that way. I've told this little story many times. A passerby saw three men cutting stone at a building site. What is it you're doing? He said to the first. 
can't you see I'm cutting stone? He replied. I'm working for the basic wage, said the second. And the third man, with shining eyes, answered, I'm helping to build a cathedral. Well, we've been blessed with more than our fair share of cathedral builders, and what otherwise could have been a pretty mundane sort of business. <laughs>